My name is Cody Deloyce. I'm the Member of Parliament in King's Hands and the Chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food. Uh, I'll be delivering my remarks this afternoon in both English and in French. Bonjour à tous, merci d'être. Ici aujourd'hui, je m'appelle Cody Blois. Je suis le député de King's Hands et le président du Comité permanent de l'agriculture et de l'agro-montaire de la Chambre de Commune. I'd like to recognize that my colleagues are here joining me today as well. Uh, they are present in the room, and I'd like to thank them for their collective work. Uh, we have uh, from the Liberal Party, uh, Ryan Turnbull, who is the Member of Parliament for Whitby, uh, who serves on the committee. Uh, Monsieur Richard Lehu, le député de Beauce, et c'est aussi un uh, député avec le Parti conservateur. Et uh, finalement, Monsieur Yves Parent, uh, le député de Berthier Maski Nongé. C'est très difficile pour un anglophone pour prononcer, mais uh, merci beaucoup à tous pour uh, votre travail extraordinaire. The members of the committee have called for a press conference with the media today to highlight our collective concern of the implications of the war in Ukraine on global food security. We are also seeking to highlight the work the committee has undertaken on this subject with our first meeting on Monday. Hearing from witnesses such as Member of Parliament Yulia Klemenko, academics from the Kyiv School of Economics, representatives from the European Union, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Les membres du committee ont convoqué une conférence de presse avec les médias aujourd'hui afin de souligner notre préoccupation collective quant aux répercussions de la guerre en Ukraine sur la sécurité alimentaire mondiale. Nous cherchons également à souligner le travail que le Comité a entrepris sur ce sujet lors de notre première réunion lundi en entendant des témoins tels que le député Yulia Klamenko, des académiques de la Kyiv School of Economics, des représentants de l'Union européenne et des organisations des Nations unies pour l'alimentation et l'agriculture. Today, in fact, this afternoon, we'll be hearing directly from the Minister of Agriculture in Ukraine, Mykola Sukolsky, about the situation on the ground, the deliberate targeting of crucial agriculture infrastructure in Ukraine by the Russian Federation, and the estimated ability for Ukraine to be able to provide its agriculture exports to the world market. We will also have the Deputy Minister of Global Affairs Canada and other officials to be able to give context about countries that are particularly vulnerable as a result of the ongoing conflict in Eastern Europe. Aujourd'hui, nous entendrons directement le ministre ukrainien de l'Agriculture, Mykola Solsky, à propos de la situation sur le terrain de ciblage délibéré de l'infrastructure agricole cruciale par la Fédération de Russie et de la capacité estimée de l'Ukraine à fournir ses exportations agricoles sur le marche, marché mondial. Le deuxième mur de la réunion d'aujourd'hui sera également marqué par la présence du sous-ministre des Affaires mondiales Canada et des fonctionnaires qui nous aideront à mettre en contexte les conséquences de la guerre sur la sécurité alimentaire mondiale. I want to highlight some facts and realities of the repercussion of what we've already heard to date. First, I believe it's well known, but Ukraine is an important global exporter of a variety of agriculture commodities. Truly, it is the breadbasket of Eastern Europe. The country exports around 58 million tons of agriculture commodities annually, with 90% of those exports being shipped through the ports, of, at ports in Azov and the Black Sea. Ukraine feeds 40 million people, uh, 400 million, pardon me, uh, people around the world, many of whom live in lower income countries. Ukraine is the largest global exporter of sunflower, sunflower oil with around 47% of supply and accounts for 10% of global wheat exports, 15% of corn, 18% of barley, and really importantly, uh, the World Food Program buys nearly 50% of its wheat from Ukraine. Cette semaine, nous avons étendu des témoignages percutants de la part de nos témoins, notamment de la députée Yulia Klemenko, qui a mis en lumière pour nous certaines des activités odieuses que la Russe a perpétuées en Ukraine. Elle est clairement indiqué que la Russie avait envisage d'attaquer et détruire des infrastructures agricoles essentielles 
telles que des installations de stockage de grains et de carburant, notamment les six plus grands silos à grains du pays. Since the outbreak of the war, Russia has been blockading the ports on the Black Sea that are so crucial to being able to move agriculture products. In Kharkiv, the Russian army has intentionally destroyed Ukraine's only national center for plant breeding research, which contained over 160,000 varieties and hybrids of seeds from around the world. Currently, nearly 20% of the country is occupied, but Ukraine is hoping to be able to harvest 80% of its arable lands in their possession. Challenges such as approximately 13% of the farmland is either mined or contains unexploded shells are a reality for farmers on the ground. And indeed, we've heard testimony that farmers have been killed simply trying to be able to plant their fields. We also have heard directly uh, from Member of Parliament Klimenko about the reality that Russia is stealing grain from Ukraine. She estimated nearly 500,000 tons of grain has been taken from Ukrainian storage for Russian benefit, including direct selling of the grain through Syria. Beyond the immediate challenge of planting and harvesting crops, there are approximately 22 million tons of grain in storage from the 2021 season that has been unable to be moved. Malgré les investissements réalisés pendant la guerre par le gouvernement ukrainien pour améliorer les accès aux fleuves, aux chemins de fer et aux autoroutes, CQ a triple la capacité d'exporter des grains et des ors des portes de la mer Noire. Madame Clemenko a estimé que cela prendrait encore 15 mois ou plus si que pose le problème de stockage inadéquat de la récolte 2022. Today, we expect to hear additional testimony from Minister Solsky, including ways in which the international community can best assist. One solution includes a UN-brokered agreement for a trade corridor, allowing Ukrainian grain to be shipped from Odessa. However, Russia has been signaling that they will only agree to this proposal if economic sanctions are lifted. We heard very clearly on Monday for Ukrainian officials, this is akin to blackmail. The reason our committee is studying this issue is because we feel it is one of the most, if not the most important challenge facing the global community. The issues matters to countries around the world, even those who are food secure. For those who aren't, the risk on a health basis and a geopolitical basis are real. Our goal is to hear from a variety of witnesses, both international and domestic, in what I foresee being three distinct areas of study. First, understanding the situation in Ukraine and the corresponding impacts on global food security. And we've started that, we'll continue that today, and I expect to hear more on Monday. Second, we'll be identifying what other countries are doing to assist in the situation, both in terms of external aid, coordination, but also in domestic supports to their agriculture industries. And third, we will bring the focus back to Canada, identifying the realities at home and how best the Government of Canada can respond. Dès après ce que nous avons étendu, il est possible et peut-être probable que les impacts correspondants sur la sécurité alimentaire mondiale se prolongent au delà 2022. Le FAO estime que la guerre en Ukraine et le ciblage délibéré de la Russie pourraient créer une hausse de 8 à 20 des prix alimentaires mondiaux. En fin de compte, le, com le community fournira un rap rapport complet et une série de recommandations au gouvernement sur la façon dont le Canada peut réagir au mieux à court terme, mais aussi à la plus long terme. Ultimately, the committee will be providing a comprehensive report and a series of recommendations to the government on ways in which Canada can best, uh, can best both respond in the short term, but also the longer term as well. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank those journalists who have made the time to be here today. We feel you have an important role in educating and explaining to Canadians some of what I've just explained and indeed what we will hear from our witnesses today. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, je suis ravi pour l'opportunité pour répondre aux vos questions. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Blois, for your presentation. Uh, just a reminder to people who are on Zoom, if you have a question, please raise your hand using the raise hand function on the system, and we'll get to you after we sort through the folks who are in the room here. Uh, okay, Tom Gorski, Black Flock Reporter. Go ahead. 
Uh, Mr. Blois, it's the third part I'm really keenly interested in. You saw StatsCan data just this morning on inflation, food cost number one. They say 24% of households they survey are now drawing on their savings to eat and 27% are borrowing to meet household expenses. In other words, a majority of your constituents and every constituent in the country, a majority are literally in real time watching their standard of living diminish because of inflation and food costs. Can you comment? Yeah, I can, Tom. And, and as I mentioned, um, this is a direct result of the war in Ukraine. Uh, yes, there are other uh, factors, including some uh, we witnessed in Canada, for example, last summer, uh, where there was severe drought in the prairie provinces that has put some of our uh, available stock behind. We've heard that uh, from other witnesses and other studies. Um, we have to be mindful, as I mentioned in my remarks, that yes, this is happening in Ukraine, but it has corresponding impacts on all of us. Canada is much more food secure than some of the countries uh, that I know we'll hear about today, particularly from Global Affairs Canada and from the FAO of the United Nations. But to your point, uh, this is having an impact on food inflation, uh, and this is going to have an impact on the availability across the world. So this is exactly the reason why this committee is studying this. Um, in the short term, I think there's going to be challenges in terms of what we can do directly. Uh, there is a geopolitical dynamic of being able to get the grain from Ukraine to market. Uh, that is something that involves foreign affairs, it involves diplomatic efforts. But you're spot on. This is something that we need to explain to Canadians is a direct result of Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, my follow-up, Dr. Charlebois, I don't know if you saw it, had comment on his uh, social media accounts uh, this morning. He put it more eloquently than I. He pointed out that we do have a, a food policy advisory council, was appointed three years ago, has been completely useless, has had nothing to say about food inflation or food insecurity in Canada, has not commented on the fact that people have faced a diminishing standard of living because of food costs, especially families, that the council has done nothing and has been in office. Uh, I think they have not had a meeting since March. Can you comment? So look, our focus right now, Tom, is on the situation that's happening globally. Our role as parliamentarians is to uh, study the issue in question, to look at and hear from witnesses, and then be able to provide recommendations back to the government. I don't have the specifics on what Mr. Charbaugh might have mentioned or what he has put out into the media, uh, but our goal is to make sure that we have concrete recommendations that we can take to the government. Uh, it may include perhaps even an interim report because this situation is evolving every day on the ground, uh, but we want to make sure that we can be helpful that we can be able to study the issue, hear from credible witnesses about how not only Canada, but our allies in the world can best respond to this. Uh, maybe that includes looking at some of the agencies in Canada and how they can help contribute towards this type of thinking as well. Uh, but that will be our focus as parliamentarians. Okay, thank you. Valérie Gamache, Radio Canada, à vous la parole. Oh, I'll ask my question in English, don't worry. <laughs> um, you talk about uh, what uh, Russia is asking about the economic sanction, about uh, like if if uh, we are lifting economic sanction, there will be authorized shipping from Odessa. Um, is there anything uh, Canada, United States, and the country from G7 could negotiate uh, on sanction with Russia? Is there any? Is there something your committee is thinking about, like negotiating with Russia? So why don't I try to answer in English and then I'll, I'll follow up in French to the best of my abilities. Um, we heard very clear on Monday from the member of parliament from Ukraine, Yulia Klemenko, that anything that would involve the lifting of sanctions on the Russian Federation to them is a blackmail. Um, what the international community may do to try to make sure that grain can move in collaboration with, of course, Ukraine uh, and trying to find a pathway with the Russian Federation, I'll leave to them. Uh, I don't know if there's specific policy positions that the parties have taken in the House of Commons as it relates to that. I, I have to assume it's a relatively sensitive matter uh, in terms of our foreign ministries that it would be looking at that, Madam Jolie. Um, you you know, our goal will ask, probably ask that question of the minister today uh, about whether or not his approach would be that that is an acceptable view to make sure that the grain can move. You have to remember that Ukraine is fighting for us all. And, you know, we're 104, 105 days into this. Uh, we need to make sure we stay resolute in supporting rules-based international order. Uh, I don't know if blocking a port and then trying to get a concession is the way that we want to negotiate. Um, but these are hard moral and ethical choices. 
Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, je vais essayer pour répondre en français. Uh, à lundi, uh, le comité a écouté très clair de le, la députée Yulia Klemenko uh, le, le prospect de la communauté internationale travailler avec Russie pour uh, manquer uh, les restrictions, les sanctions économiques pour s'assurer uh, que c'est possible pour uh, bouger le grain. Uh, vers les portes de ça, c'est comme blackmail. Donc, uh, je pense que les questions sont très sensitives. Uh, c'est nécessaire pour les différents uh, ministres de, des Affaires étrangères discuter avec l'Ukraine. Et je ne sais pas la position de la partie à la Chambre, mais uh, probablement la question uh, va soulever par les, par les uh, différents membres de la comité uh, cet après-midi uh, vers le ministre Solsky. Talk about the consequences on the Canadian supply chain food. Which product uh, are actually at stake? Yeah, just so I can be clear on your question, uh, you're asking which of the Canadian products are most likely to yep. replace Ukrainian products mm -hmm. in the market. Um, so particularly in Western provinces uh, where we, you know, that could be considered the breadbasket in Canada and North America, uh, we're looking at uh, canola, we're looking at grains, uh, oats, barley. Those are the types of products that are particularly important in Ukraine. That'll be a major focus, but indeed there's, on, there's ongoing consequences. We heard from FAO this morning, some of my colleagues uh, were able to join uh, Beth Becknell, who is the Deputy Director General uh, for FAO. Uh, and the consequences are, include even just feed for livestock animals in Ukraine. But in particular, the world relies on Ukraine, as I mentioned in my remarks, quite heavily on those types of grains and those types of products. That's probably how best Canada can respond is through those same commodities on the global market. Donc, encore en français? No? Okay. Okay, there are a few people on Zoom. Uh, if you want to ask a question, hit the raise hand function now and we'll get you lined up. Okay. Okay, Marie Wolf with the Canadian Press. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to ask some more, if I may, about um, what Canada can do to fill the gap. Um, and I was told that, that actually Canada's harvest last year was not particularly good and not as good as Australia's. And I wondered um, how much is in Canada's grain stores and how much practically... Canada can provide to, to fill the gap um, that particularly developing nations, uh, you know, uh, who rely on Ukrainian wheat. Thank you, Maria, for the question. So I'm going to try to cover three different angles. Uh, we heard on the committee on Monday, Ms. Klemenko was quite strong, of course, on heavy weapons uh, to Ukraine, ultimately to win the war. Uh, that was her position. Uh, there's the, as I mentioned, the foreign affairs aspect in terms of is there a way to broker a solution uh, to make sure that the grain can get to market. Uh, looking through the agriculture lens, though, what, what we've heard both this morning from FAO and indeed in our testimony on Monday, um, I mentioned, for example, Kharkiv, where the um, plant breeding plant or the plant research, uh, plant breeding research station, I should say, uh, was was attacked. Canada has a lot of capacity in that regard. Is there an ability for us to be able to provide seeds and different varieties to help Ukraine rebuild its stock? There's one option. We heard from the Canadian Food Grains Bank on Monday about ways in which Canada can increase its aid through an international development lens, uh, particularly in supporting countries that are vulnerable with more uptake of their own domestic food production. Um, I think we've heard today also in terms of some of the explicit targeting of farm infrastructure, a big focus is on temporary storage. So as I mentioned, if, if the grain can't move, there is about a one-year uh, shelf life. Uh, that there is, We do have some time, but the grain stores are largely full in Ukraine. So as harvest starts to come off in 2022, there remains really important questions about where we actually store grain uh, and, and whether or not temporary silos can be established. Uh, 
we heard from Ms. Clemenko, and again, I'm, I'm referencing her quite often because she was very strong in terms of her testimony on Monday about, as I mentioned, 13 percent of the actual arable lands in, in Ukraine are being estimated that they either have uh, mines that are there or un, unexploded shells. So what can the international community do to help support the type of equipment that might be needed in those cases to actually clear the fields and help support farmers? The last thing I'll say uh, is we did hear from FAO today about just even capacity in rural Ukraine. We know that there has been uh, a quite significant exodus of nationals that have left, um, even in terms of having the labor on the ground to help plant and harvest the crop, uh, some targeted funding towards rural capacity in Ukraine for those areas that are remain unoccupied um, is, is some of the suggestions that we've heard. But I don't want to presuppose other uh, elements, uh, but those are some of the things we've heard to date. Follow up, Marie. Um, yes, if I may. I mean, I was very interested in what you said about providing temporary silos. Do you think that's something that Canada could provide? And also with regard to farm machinery, which the Russians have been uh, targeting, I don't know whether that includes combine harvesters, but obviously there's no shortage of them in Canada. Can you talk any more about the kind of practical farm uh, infrastructure help that Canada could provide and is possibly considering? I think, uh, Marie, if there's a will, there's a way. Um, as you mentioned, we do have a lot of expertise and I'll say farm capital in this country. Um, whether or not the logistics of getting that from North America to Europe, I, I just imagine would be quite difficult. So I don't want to go too far down the road of telling you what may or may not be possible, but that's some of what we're hearing um, from folks that are on the ground. Those will be questions that we'll have the opportunity to pose to the government as part of our recommendations in terms of saying these are things that we should be looking at to respond uh, in a relatively quick manner. On the silos in particular, I'm told that the actual shelf life of how long the grain can be stored and then we heard this today is about four or five months uh, so that is perhaps a temporary solution it will not be a permanent one uh, and there's again supply chain logistics of how you actually get that into Ukraine we did hear that officials in the country are looking at trying to make sure that if there is opportunities to move grain by rail um, by river, as I explained earlier in my remarks, or by auto route, those things are being explored. But just the, given the quantity of how important Ukraine is in the global market, um, it is not significant enough to be able to move the 22 million tons of grain that are being reported still in the country. Uh, but there is work ongoing, I understand, with Poland and Romania about temporary storage in those countries that ha might have a little bit more capacity. Okay, we do have time for more questions. So if someone on Zoom wants to raise their hand, go ahead. If not, Valerie, do you have another question? You're good? All right. That concludes today's press conference then. Thank you so much, Mr. Blois, for coming to us today. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.